Well, that, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Jesus, Romans 12, Romans chapter 12. I want you to turn there with me. This passage I, I touched on last week, but I, I hadn't had a chance to share it with you tonight. Uh, the beginnings were here. I just used it kind of as a, a touch point for introducing them and their, their mission, their vision. Uh, most of you know that very well, but I, I could not pass up the opportunity to preach a message on Romans chapter 12 whenever possible. <coughs> Because I believe it's a wonderful picture for us of how we as Christians should prepare ourselves in Christ for what God wants to do in us. And the church has to be ready, both in season and out of season, to answer the questions. I'm at a store the other day, and someone says to me, and just going back a little bit to our morning service, they said to me, well, you know, it doesn't matter what God these presidential candidates serve. In the end, they're all the same God. Well, that, we as Christians know that's not the case. And I'm not going to give you an apologetic lesson, but I'll simply say this. If a, a God or a, a demigod talks about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and anything else other than God's Son come to earth to die and rise from the grave for the sins of mankind to redeem us of our sins, it ain't the same God. If our God sent Jesus that way. And so any other God that is talked about is not. We need to be able to give an answer in season now. The way that happens is when we are willing to submit ourselves fully uh, to the Lord. Fully to the Lord. And that's what this passage begins with and, and teaches us. Uh, but I want to share a story with you to give you an idea of what someone's impersonation or impression might be when they visit the church. Uh, not this one. But this is a letter from a high school girl. She wrote this to her friend after a visit to the church. She wrote, I attended your church yesterday. Although you had invited me, you weren't there. I looked for you, hoping to sit with you, but I sat alone instead. A stranger, I wanted to sit near the back of the church, but those rows were all packed with regular attenders, I assume. An usher took me down to the very front. I felt as though I were on parade. During the singing of the hymns, I was surprised to note that some of the church people weren't even singing. Between their sighs and yawns, they just stared into space. Three of the kids that I had respected on campus were whispering to one another throughout the whole service. Another girl was in the back giggling. I really didn't expect that in your church. The pastor's sermon was very interesting, although some members of the choir didn't seem to think so. They looked bored and restless. One kept smiling at someone in the congregation. There were several people who left and then came back during the sermon. And I thought, how rude. I could hear the constant shuffling of feet and doors opening and closing. The pastor spoke about the reality of faith. The message got to me and I made up my mind to speak to someone about it after the service. But utter chaos reigned after the benediction. I said good morning to one couple, but their response was less than cordial. I looked for some teens with whom I could discuss the sermon, but they were all huddled in a corner talking about the newest music group. My parents don't go to church. I came alone yesterday hoping to find a place to truly worship and, I, and feel some love. I'm sorry, but I didn't find it at your church. I won't be back. This passage tells us God's people are called to be a living sacrifice. It's not just evangelism, but it's how we prepare ourselves in the presence of God, not only in our corporate time together, but also in our private time to give an answer for what God has called us to be. And that's what this passage talks about. First, it talks about personal preparation in Romans 12.1. And once we've been personally prepared by the Lord, it talks about how we should conduct ourselves in our transforming life in Christ. Sometimes we just get caught up on how cool a person is instead of what it's really asking us and telling us to be about. So I want you to stand. We're going to read this and then we'll begin to talk together for a little bit about it. Romans 12, starting at verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, 
which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have the gifts that differ according to grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, uh, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. If a service in his uh, if in service, in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberal uh, liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Heavenly Father, touch us tonight, Lord. I pray that you would guide and direct us to understand the truth of your word. Move us, Father, to, to know what it is you've called us to do, what it is you've called us to be, who it is you've called us to serve, and why it is you've called us together. If we will understand these teachings of, of Paul, Lord, to a church that was in disarray, a church that had a bad vision, a church that had maybe no vision at all, if we as your church here at Bolt can understand what it is that we are called by you, our Lord, to do, then we will be usable by you. Fill us with humility that is not natural in our own self. Give us vision that we cannot see with our own eyes. Build up in us a wisdom which will transcend our understanding. And Lord, by all means, give us a passion which will overcome our fear. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, for those of you that weren't here to this morning, we had a, an eventful... Uh, conclusion to our service. Mike uh, Paul uh, was sick at the end of our service with what he thought at the time might be a heart condition. I want to pass on to you uh, that although he was uh, taken away in the ambulance, he's already been released from the hospital. So we praise God for that. Prayer does work, right? We prayed over him and God answered the prayer. We're not going to let the devil take away God's blessing and God's joy upon us. We pray, God answered that prayer, and the glory goes to the Father. Mike is home resting with his family. Medications are being adjusted as we speak. Also want to lift up to you, Liz. I pray for her in the morning service. Want to remind you to pray for her in the evening service and then throughout the week. A lot of decisions need to be made about where she's going to be and, and the uh, healing and the reception that she's going to receive from doctors. And uh, without getting into it too much, she, she does need your, uh, your constant prayers over her. So... Praise God that we have continued opportunities to pray uh, for folks in our church. Pray for Liz's husband, James, too, who tries to balance taking care of his wife and, and going to work to be able to provide for their needs and their bills and so forth. <clears throat> I want to just bless you for that. But looking back at Romans 12, because I believe even in these moments that we had today, uh, for those that did not notice, Harvey and his daughter Candace came forward having rededicated their lives to the Lord and seeking to join our church. We'll introduce them again next week when it's not such a chaotic ending. We had a, a visitor today who uh, the, was met by our church members out in the community, was told about our church and, and shared with. She came and visited. She enjoyed the service, came down, rededicated her life to the Lord, asked for prayer to uh, over. You met her. her name was Michelle. God was moving this morning in the service, and I'm very, very blessed to have been a part of it with you. When that happens, I think the first thing we see is what it says in, in chapter 12, verse 1, that Paul is urging the church. Why was he urging the church? Well, he was urging them because they were not doing it. If they would have been doing it, he would have continued to exhort them or continue to bless them. But his urging came out of the fact that they were not doing what God had called them to do. So I need to point that out to you so that you understand the, the direction that Paul is coming to that church so that we will never be a church that needs to be urged 
but we'll be a church that just needs to continue to do it, to be exhorted to it, to be carrying on what God is already doing. But he urges them to present their bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, understand to, to understand that, that phrase, we're going to have to understand what the sacrificial system was all about. And I, I don't want to give an expose on that tonight or anything, but, but I just want to tell you that when the, under the law, when the Hebrew nation would bring together uh, their fatted calves or the turtle doves and all the different things that you read about in Scripture as uh, sacrifice to the Lord, what they would do is they would get the very best of their litter, the best of their uh, herds, and they would bring them before the Lord. They bring them to the temple where they were gathered by the priest, the person who represented uh, the Lord in the temple there. And their very best animal, the very best thing they could bring, was brought having been fed by the very best food, cared for in the home by the very best nature. Now I want to point out something to you today. The problem with many of our churches today in their service to the Lord is we're not giving our very best. We're coming to church beaten down and tired. We are coming to church with an attitude that says, I don't want to be here. We're coming to church because it's what we're supposed to do, not because it's a great joy and freedom that the Lord has provided for us to be able to do so. I tell you today that there are churches throughout the world that would give anything they had to be able to serve their community openly and often. And yet the American church especially has gotten very comfortable with us just doing a little ministry in and around the building that God has put us in. But that is what the church is about. And so when Paul urged them to offer themselves as a living sacrifice, he was telling them to give the best that you have. Your best time. Your best energy. Your best effort. That's what he's calling us to do. And that's a very important part of this process. You see, if we don't give God our best, how can He accept it as a sacrifice? Well, I'll give Him this one. It doesn't really work anyway. That's not a gift. That's a discarding. That's a discarding. God is at the Red Cross. He's not going to take the things that we don't want to wear anymore. That doesn't mean there's not something wrong with the Red Cross. That simply means that God is different. He deserves the very best man. And we should be willing to give it. Because Paul said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is what? Acceptable to God. Will He accept our lesser sacrifice? Not a lot of heads not. No, Kurt, He won't accept our lesser sacrifice. Let me put it to you in a different way, ladies. Your husband came home and he said to you, honey, I love you. I love you 95%. There's people at work. There's this girl that's my secretary. I really love her too. 5%. Not much. Just 5%. 95% though. I love you 95%. Would it be enough? Well then it's not unusual that our God is not going to do it. Men, if our wife said to us, Honey, you're one of the top five strongest guys I've ever met. You're more courageous than half the men I know. Would that be enough, men? No, I don't think so. No, we don't say bye. We say, well, we've got to fix it. <laughs> but, but we're saying, I don't think so. God wants us to present ourselves as an acceptable sacrifice, which means we must come in our very best way. And Paul was trying to tell the church that because they weren't doing that. They were giving just enough or they were giving what didn't hurt and I'm not just talking about the finances, although that's part of it. Do you know, church, that as God continues to bring us new families and ministry opportunities, and these people come forward and continue to, to rededicate their lives to the Lord and the children that they bring with them, we are limited in space in our nursery. Do you know that we're limited in space in the Sunday school department? One more room is all we have. And that's because we already took one class and moved it to Sunday night outside of the church building. And that's the only reason why we had that one class. So as God continues to grow us, we need the resources, but more than the resources, we just need to give God our best. Whatever that means. 
And whatever He's called you to do, give Him your best. Acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. When I was in the military and they would call us to deployments anywhere throughout the world at short notice, we were not called there because we could do an adequate job. We were not called there because they didn't have anybody else available. Our units were called there because we were the very best at what we did. And because we were the very best at what we did, the job would get done with excellence and it would get done ahead of time and it would be done right the first time. And that is what God is looking for. So when we're talking about service, we're talking about the things we do for the Lord and we do them with those excellent things. And the Bible says in verse 2 that if we will present ourselves as a living sacrifice, it will honor God with our very best and something will happen. And that something is this, it will not be conformed any longer to the ways of this world. Do you know that it's not uncommon for people in the workplace out there in the world at all these different secular jobs to just do enough? I've heard that in some places they tell you to slow down production so that you don't raise it outside of the realm of being able to achieve it next year. We want to go just a little better than last year, but we don't want to go so much. If you've employed people, you know that there are times when someone will not give their best. Because they're conforming to what is normal in society. But God has told us that we no longer are to be conformed. But because He is Lord and we've offered ourselves a living sacrifice, that He is transforming us. So it says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. There was a professor, a guy out in Colorado, David Nobel, I think is his name. He wrote a book about this passage and it has really become a, a ministry for him. But he said that the battlefield that's being referenced here is not a, a, a parcel of ground. It's not a battlefield in which uh, God is on one side and, and Satan is on the other, or Satan is on one side and man is over here and we're crossing a valley before we engage the enemy. No, what he said is the battlefield is, is what is in our mind. What we know and understand about the Lord. What we're willing to do in our serving God or serving the enemy. So the battlefield is over our minds, according to him. And it says, uh, renewing by the renewing of your mind, which gives very strong credence to what he said, so that you may prove what the will of God is. I remember a time when God called me to ministry. I was very young, probably 17 years old, 16. I was in a service at a campsite, a place with youth. God called me to ministry. I went forward. I didn't know what for. I just went forward. I was so naive. I thought, you know, hey, I'll do ministry. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what it... I, you know, I'm just going to trust God. The beauty of being young. But over time, that became garbled in my mind. The devil attacked in trying to make me concerned with what other people thought. And so for 13 years I ran. 13 years I ran. And then I, I recognized that, that God really was calling me into service. That He really was calling me into service. I didn't know what that meant though. So in a church before here, they asked if there was a need for student work. Can I be candid and say I really didn't know if I'd even like teenagers at the time? But somebody thought because I was a young man and a soldier, they might enjoy getting to know me. So they asked me to come along and join. And I told you that story, I'm not going to tell you that story again, except to tell you this. When I answered the calling that second time, and I submitted myself to the Lord, He began to transform my mind. And in the transformation of my mind, something happened. I kept serving, giving him my best. I just became a Wednesday night teacher. And then they asked me to be the youth group Sunday school director. And after that, they said, would you ever be considered, would you ever consider becoming a student pastor? I said, well, that sounds really cool. So I tried it out. And then you folks called me, and I came. And what happened was pretty special, and I think speaks really clearly to this last part of verse 2. A time came when what God had called me to do, His will in my life, 
was affirmed by you, the church. Because in 2004, you ordained me as a pastor. I was licensed at that church, and then you ordained me. And in the ordination, you recognized, in accordance with your message, in the form I still hold very dear to in my office, you said, we recognize God's hand is upon you. What a beautiful picture of what it says. Let me read it to you again in verse 2. Renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is. You see, as he transformed me, I became part of who he was. His will became clear. Upon seeking and following his will, it was proved out in my life by those who were in direct line with my ministry. And he says, that which is good and acceptable and perfect does not mean that everything that I do in ministry is perfect. In fact, I would venture to say that I'll fail more times in ministry than I'll succeed. But God, through my failures, will give great blessing. Because our God is able to overcome even those. But the thing that He needs is my willingness to submit. When I submit, He is free to work through me. And that's what the Bible is telling us. Our relationship to God starts at full surrender. Think about that for a minute. Not partial surrender, full surrender. When Ruth and I got married, it was very easy for me to say I do. I'm certain that after the 18 or 20 minutes that she took to consider that question from the preacher, uh, she, and saying yes, she realized a commitment that was important, that what it would take. Now, 22 years of marriage from this person, from this direction, has been very, very good, very, very easy. But I know for a fact that from her direction, it's not always been easy. But when she committed to do it, she was determined to be a part of it. And 22 years later, you know this. I don't have to tell you. It's better than day one. It is. It starts at full surrender, though. That day at the altar, when I surrendered to be her husband, and she surrendered to be my wife, was a picture of our surrender before our Lord. How beautiful is that? Do you think the marriage would be stronger in our country if that was the message that we have? That the marriage in our homes is a picture of the marriage between Christ and His church? It is the message of the Bible, by the way. This is not new. It's all in here. We just forgot the message somewhere along the way. And so what I tell you today is, if we will fully surrender in accordance with what verse 1 says, we'll also see that our relationship with God continues with obedience. Then once I surrender, my obedience must follow. Because to be honest with you, surrender without obedience is no surrender at all. Correct? If, sur if I surrender and I'm not obedient to the Lord who I surrender to, Kurt, I want you to surrender to me. All right, Lord. Now, Kurt, I want you to go and be a pastor. No, I'm not going to do it. I want you to go be a missionary. No, I'm not going to do it. That's not surrender at all. I will do what God sends me. I will go where God says to go. No matter how hard, no matter how easy, I will do what God says. But it requires a break from the world system. You've got it made. You're in a good place. You should just relax and enjoy the ride. These are not phrases that Christians live by, but these are phrases the world teaches. And if we're not careful, the renewing of our mind will go in a different direction. We'll follow in the direction of the enemy. I think that's why Paul starts off by telling the church, you had better have a relationship with me that is clear. It's why he tells the church first and foremost what relationship looks like. But once he diagrams it, he goes on. And so I want to go on by looking at verse 4. And moving forward, verse 4 says, For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. Now, wouldn't it be something if every one of us in here was a preacher? We'd all line up here in the front. Garvin, you might be the only other person that didn't want a preacher. And you finish the singing all by yourself. And we would all, you'd nod, and we would all come up. And we'd all start talking. It could be pretty confusing. I mean, it'd be funny. To even think about how that would work. Or if we're all Sunday school teachers, 
or if we were all the ones who cleaned the church, or if we were all the ones that simply came to fill the seats. You see, we're all different parts of the body, and there's a purpose for that. I don't need to get any deeper than that. You get that. That picture is clear. God has designed us differently with different sets of skill. I can't sing. Well, I certainly can't lead at singing and worship. I cannot do that. But, but we have people who can. I can't work with children, but we have highly gifted people who can. When you put us all together, God has a great plan. And He's got a pretty usable force for His kingdom purpose. That's why I love the difference of people. Somebody comes in and, and somebody says, well, you know, I don't really know what their gift is. Well, cool, because we have some holes. We've got some openings, you know what I'm saying? We've got some places that need to be filled. And I'm excited about the opportunities because we're looking for the parts of the body to come together. Verse 5 says, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And although we have individual gifts and individual talents, when God brings us together, it's pretty neat how it works. And that's not played out in question or in theory. That's played out. When we do the Harvest Fest, there will be 50 of us here. And we will put on a wonderful ministry for over 1,000 people. When we did the fifth quarter, it was amazing how people came together and filled those roles that you guys needed done. It was amazing. And what the best part was is that I'm still hearing how God blessed our community through it. And we're starting to see some of that beautiful return on the investment <coughs> to the Lord. I don't care if we ever have another student or adult join our church as long as we do the ministry that will be usable by God. It will be about His business. But I do believe, having said that, that if we do His ministry, we do His work, serve cohesively as a body of Christ, that God will bless us and give us more ministry opportunity. And I do think it will resolve in more. But in the end, my purpose is not to grow the church. My purpose is to bless the Lord. Because one will end in futility. Because Kirk can't do it well enough. The other one in glory because it is God's perfect plan. I want to serve God with excellence. I'll do whatever He says. In 2013 going forward, our focus is on discipleship. It's on building the body of Christ for a purpose. And so I'm looking forward to see what that purpose is. But in the meantime, we're going to grow in our wisdom of the Lord. That means He has to impart it upon us. We're going to grow in our service to the Lord. That means we have to be willing to roll up our sleeves. We're going to grow in the, the knowledge that our community has about what we offer. And all those things take work. But we're going to see God do some amazing things. And we can't do it alone, so we need to bring other people in. As God continues to bless this group of people that keep joining, we cannot just assume that they know everything there is to know about service to the Lord. In fact, I want to make a challenge to you, church, because this is not our, the, the extent of our core, but this is a good portion of it. Let's always assume that someone comes in, makes a commitment to the Lord. Let's just assume, until we know better, that they need a, a full amount of training. Let's assume they need a Sunday school class and don't know what we offer. Let's assume they don't know what praise is, and so let's ask them to join us, sit with us while we worship. Let's not assume that they know the difference between a hymn and a contemporary song. So let's, let's share with them what they do and what the purpose of them are. Let's not assume that they know they can sit anywhere. Let's invite them to be in with us. Let's make an effort to bring them in to the point where they're comfortable enough that they'll do the same to others. That's a picture of discipleship. What's wrong with the church today in America, and places other than America, is we bring them in, they come down, we introduce them to Jesus, we all clap, and then we put them in a pool up there, we dip them under water, and then we sit them down in the pew, and we move on to the next person. And they don't know any longer what they're supposed to do. They don't understand what our ministries are. And so we're not a cohesive body. Because when we don't know what to do, we start interjecting our thoughts into God's plan. We begin to tell God what we want. And when we tell God what we want, we take away what He's doing. 
we move it aside. So the body becomes dysfunctional. We see that in corporations across America today. But it's not happening in the church. Verse 6 says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Don't do something that isn't your gifting. If you're like me and can't sing well, or can't lead singing well, don't take that upon yourself to do it. I want to make this statement in front of my church, in front of the world on the internet. This is true. I don't want you to do a job, church, unless God tells you to do it first. If I come and ask you, will you be willing to consider this? It is simply that. It's, it's a question for you to pray over. It is not coercion from the pastor. It is not the deacons who have sent me to you because we think you're the most qualified or the most intelligent in that area. We are simply looking for God's fit. If you are not that person, two things happen. One, you become embittered towards that ministry because it's a job. It's not a blessing. The second thing is you fill that role and you hide it and you hold it from the person called by God to do it. So we are going about things differently. We're going to leave spots in our list of things that need to be done and we're going to wait for God's person. But when it happens, we're going to watch God multiply. Because that's the way the church is supposed to be. That's the way I understand Scripture to be. Because the Bible tells me that those with the right gifts need to be put with the right job. And when that happens, it will bring honor and glory to God. Verse 7 says, If service in His serving, if we're going to do work, we might as well do it for the Lord. If we're going to do work, we're going to honor God with our work. Verse 8 says, Or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, there are a lot of things in the church to do, are there not? Paul is just list, listing a very short amount. Probably areas of weakness in that church. We don't need to list our weaknesses. We know them. God knows them. Let's fill them when God calls you to it. Let love be without hypocrisy. There's a good point to make. Let love be without hypocrisy. Paul was telling the church because they're being hypocrites, right? The Jews were angry with the Gentiles. Gentiles were angry with the Jews. Leadership was angry with both of them. And God was angry with all of them. There was a major problem in the church. But the reality was that God was trying to get them to do is understand, stop doing church and start being the church. And that's a big difference. We'll be the church when we love one another. Is it John? The book of John says, you will know they are my disciples when, you love one when they love one another. Before we can truly be disciples of Christ, we must love. Study for almost a year on unity that we did together. But only you know if you're unified. But unity is shown best in the demonstration of love. Once the church loves one another, it'll be very easy to go out in the world. It'll be very easy. How many people have seen that broken legged dog run alongside the road and not thought to yourself, man, I got to save that thing? <coughs> very easy. To see the brokenness of the world have compassion. Sometimes it's much harder to see the brokenness of the church to be willing to do the work to see it fixed. How many people know of a church that has died almost to nothing because the people in the church were never willing to yield for the purpose of God to move? Do you understand if we won't yield, God will yield our blessing? He'll yield to it, He'll withhold it. He will not bless a church that is disunified. And so when he tells us to love, as this verse says, we must love. Love without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Evil. <laughs> Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Now I can say all day I love my brother. But devotion is not as easy. Let me give you an example. Loving them is saying, I can't wait till I see them on Sunday to find out how they're doing. Devotion says, I'm going to go see them Saturday morning to see how they're doing. Love says, I'm going to give them a call and make sure they're all right. Devotion says, I'm going to go help them do those things I know they need done so that they're all right. Love says, I'm going to invest a little bit of time in you. Devotion says, I'm going to invest the time you need. Love says, I'm willing to pray for the discipleship. Devotion says I'm willing to do discipleship. The Bible calls 
calls us to be devoted to one another. Ooh, we're running out of time. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Contributing to the needs of the saints, participating, or I'm sorry, with these eyes, I'm sorry, participating, but it means practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. I said it in the morning service, I'll say it again. I don't have a problem with people not liking me. My wife will tell you, and I will be honest to you, it hurts the, the flesh. It hurts. That first jab hurts. I don't like the way you preach. But let me tell you what God tells me over a short period of time. He says, Kurt, they killed me. Why are you so upset if they don't like you? And then I go, all right. You're right. <clears throat> it ain't about me. So when someone persecutes me and God gets a hold of me, that's why we need to be in prayer, we need to be in His Word. When someone persecutes us, we have got to remember that they persecuted the Savior. They persecuted the one perfect person in the world. And if they did it to Him, then it's certainly going to happen to us. So the responsibility for us is to recognize that when the persecution comes, we just need to let it go. Because if God is for us, then it can be against us. And that's God's promise. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Oh, but the cursing is easy, right? Well, they don't like me? Well, let me tell you about that. <laughs> I practice that stuff. I know it's easy. And so what we need to do is trust God's Word. You know what's going on at that church and why God ended up dispersing me? Well, it's because the cursing you became louder than the blessing. Let God's church never be that. You practice it as an example of me. And I will practice it as an example of you. Can I just tell you a theory of mine? Some of you can amen this. Maybe you'll see what we amen it. If you go to the perfect church, you're going to be the one who destroys it. <laughs> just saying. If they ever called me to be the pastor of the perfect church, I would have to turn it down because I would destroy it. God has a plan for us. That plan is beautiful. But it begins full submission and transformation of our lives. And that's what Paul told the church. Now they didn't hear it, by the way. They never heard it. They read it. They nodded with it. They never heard it. And so just a few years later, that church no longer existed. Go to church. See if you can find First Baptist from them. Go to church there. See if you can find a Christian. Praising God, worshiping the Lord Church in the center of Rome. It just don't exist. But what you love to be able to see God bless this community for hundreds of years based on your building a cohesive body of Christ. Let me give you one more caution. Don't be offended by this. But you cannot be responsible for how other people do their part. You can only be responsible for you doing yours. So no offense, Stephen, but I'm just going to do the part that God's called me to do. I'm going to do it with excellence. And I'm going to pray and work with you for you to do yours. But, church, if any one of us doesn't, the minute we start pointing fingers is the minute we've all broken off. From God's plan. So we're going to lift up those in need. Thank you for being my victim. <laughs> but we're going to lift up those in need. We're going to bless those through prayer. And then we start with the 40 days of prayer. You see, I don't want to just pray for God to heal our nation. Because we won't see that effect immediately. But what we will pray for in our time together here, when we come, we'll pray for this church. Because a nation will be healed because a few of God's people get on their knees and begin to pray for him to come. The Welsh Revival was not started by a group of churches doing a life-wave biblical ministry. It was started by one 13-year-old girl who got kicked out of a church because she didn't have the right kind of clothes. And because she didn't have the right kind of clothes, she went to praying, God, help me to find clothes so I can go to church there. 
I wouldn't even want to go to church there. But she did. So she began to pray. God blessed more than a million people with salvation in that movement. So you tell me what can our church do? Well, compared to what God did, if we do the ratio out, a whole bunch to this body of believers. I think we're beginning to see some of that. But it's going to take work. And roll the sleeves. You have to be willing to be part of the body. You have to be willing to get dirty. Because we're not looking for the clean ones. That's our young man. We're looking for the dirty ones. That sweet, sweet aroma of a lost woman that comes to know Jesus. It's a sacrifice that God smelled from the priest who the animal. That beautiful aroma which told God not that this is a good piece of meat, but this is good sacrifice because they've given all they have for you. That same aroma we want God to smell today about His church. By your Heavenly Father, Lord, bless this church. Lord, through my imperfections as pastor, give me uh, people alongside of me who will overcome my weaknesses. Build up this, your body, not as a, a, a pastor-led church, but as a, a God-led church. Build us up and strengthen us, Father, so that as the ministries come, we won't have to look for workers. We'll have to tell them we'll get you on the next one. We've got enough help. Bring people, bring workers to this, your church. We need the help. Bring balanced wisdom through our senior adults and energy through our young people. But Lord, never stop blessing us. Father, we're not going to let go of you. We want that double blessing. And Father, I ask you tonight, would you just move in us? But Father, if there's even one person in this place has not offered themselves as a sacrifice to you, if there's one person that has done it but not with a whole heart, if there's one person that is not willing to be transformed in their mind or is unyielding in their desire to put both feet in opposite fingers or opposite camps. If there's even one person, don't let them go home tonight. Burden them with your love. That this would be your church, Father. Not that we would receive glory. You even warn us in this passage about that, but that you would receive the glory. I want to say every day when I come to, to church to do the job you called me to do, Lord, I want to say I cannot understand why God continues to bless us in the manner He does. <clears throat> Fix my weaknesses, Lord, or blind them to them. Cover them for your purpose. And Lord, when I look out into this community, help me see them with your eyes. And when we go about doing your work, help us to see them in the manner in which your son walked his ministry on this earth. Father, when the end of the day comes and we take our rest, Lord, bless us for serving you. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.